You've got an exam on Wednesday. So I've already mentioned that uh, I'm going to provide an equation packet. And in addition to that, you're allowed to bring a, a page of notes front and back of the paper. Um, since you're going to be probably solving at least one of those exam questions using Excel, my suggestion is uh, re-familiarize yourself with the procedure so that you'd be able to start from a blank workbook and solve the problems that you've used Excel to solve so far this semester. Uh, so we'll do that exam in class on Wednesday. Uh, homework 6, which is having to do with prompts, is also due on Wednesday. Today I'm going to be talking about the design project, which will kind of kick in through various phases over the course of the semester. Uh, before we start talking about the design project, are there any questions on the announcements? Okay. In the design project, we're going to begin with a hypothetical uh, piece of land where we want to provide the water network that would be suitable for the planned use of that area. So it's kind of a land development project in a sense, the hydraulic implications of a land development project. And so the map that I'm giving you right now is scaled so that um, one centimeter, if you, if you have a, a ruler and you measure one centimeter, then that represents 100 meters in real life or at least in this project. Well, let me show you some of the things about this map. Um, this hypothetical city is going to have three different zones, a north zone, south zone, east zone, and then uh, outside of these city limits there are a couple of um, point demands of water, a sports stadium, a cardboard box factory, a golf course, a housing project, a hospital. Any place there's a green arrow, that's where water is going to be coming out of the network. Now, these thick black lines aren't necessarily where you have to put the pipes. These thick black lines just represent the city limits, and then these dashed blue lines represent the boundaries between zones. So where you have to deliver water is the, uh, the green arrows. So you'll notice that each of the interior zones has two green arrows. And so all of the water that's being demanded by the north zone is being delivered at junction A and junction M. Those are the only two places that water is being delivered to the north zone. Part of this project, you're going to be estimating how much water people will demand in the north zone. Every student is going to have slightly different um, assigned assumptions for population density, for the uh, type of businesses that are in each of the zones. And so you're going to have a, a table, I'll show you in a moment, where all of the assigned assumptions will guide you through the process of uh, figuring out on the hottest day of the year, where there's lots of demand because of uh, irrigation and, you know, on the peak hour of the hottest day of the year, uh, how much water is going to be demanded at the north zone, the south zone, the east zone. Because we want to size this network so that it doesn't fail on the hottest day of the year. If you make the pipes only big enough for the average day, then that means that on the extreme day, where the demands are much higher than the average, the pipes will be too small, and there's not enough capacity to get the water where it needs to be. So the first phase of this project is demand estimation, where you're trying to assign an amount to these green arrows, so that you know on this map how much water has to be delivered and at what location. So you'll go through the process of looking at the sports stadium, for instance. In the uh, demand estimation, the parameters that I assign you, I tell you how many seats are in the sports stadium, but I don't tell you how much water they need. You're going to have to think through the process of how much water does a person use in a sports stadium. 
And so I, I give you some information that will address those issues, but I'd encourage you to also do additional thought and additional outside research to try and fill in the gaps. Um, you'll be thinking about how much water is used at a golf course of a certain size. And in the project description, for instance, I tell you that you can assume that the grass on the golf course requires one inch of water each week. But then each person is going to be assigned a different city. And you're supposed to look up the weather data for that city to find out you know, in the driest week of the year how much rainfall do they have. Because you're going to have to make up the difference between the water demand of one inch per week of the grass versus how much rainfall during that driest week of the year is going to be provided versus you're going to have to make up the difference with the irrigation. So at each one of these locations, you're going to go through that same process of demand estimation. Now, is it going to be 100% accurate? Well, of course not. But it's kind of your first round of assumptions and calculations as a placeholder. And later on in the process, you may have additional time to refine your estimates. Or maybe when you're doing engineering design, your client will only have an initial guess of what their requirements are and you want to start doing your calculations based on the best available information that they have at that moment and then you can go back and refine the design and refine uh, for instance how big the pipes would need to be once they have more information later in the future for what the actual demands are. Um, these curved lines are contours and so it's an elevation map and it's in meters and what you'll notice is that there is a hillside to the northwest of town. And uh, on your map, it's, it doesn't seem to be pictured here on this image, but on your paper map, there's a strange symbol by the 300 mark. So that symbol represents where the water is coming from. There's a spring at that location. And um, what you'll be doing is once in phase one, you estimate the demands at each of these green arrows. In phase two of the project, you're going to be sizing the pipes using water gems for that to figure out how big does the pipe need to be to get the water from the spring towards this control point A. And then how large do each of the pipes that carry water throughout your network need to be? Now, it's partly about pipe sizing and it's also about pipe layout. And so think about what would be the most inefficient way to get the water to each of these locations. Well, the most inefficient way, I think, would be to have a separate pipe going from the spring towards each junction. So you'd have a pipe from the spring to A, from the spring to B, from the spring to C. And that would be really kind of ridiculous. But what if you had one coming from the spring to pipe A, to location A, and then connect from A to B, from B to C? That's a little bit more like it. But uh, there's other things that maybe are a little bit less obvious. You know, for example, if you're going from location K to I, would there be any sense of following the city limits, or do you just connect the dots uh, directly? Or what about how to get the water here to location M? Should it come from B downward? Should it come from L sideways? And then what would that mean about how you're getting water to location O? So you'll be kind of optimizing to try and reduce the total pipe length and also reduce the pipe sizes um, where the pressure in the network is coming from the fact that you're going to put a tank on this hillside somewhere a water storage tank, an elevated tank, is what will provide the pressure at location A. And the constraints that you're going to be following is that um, during this maximum design condition where it's the hottest day of the year and everyone's somehow simultaneously flushing the toilets and uh, washing the dishes and taking a shower and washing their clothes, you know, like peak demand, uh, you want the pipes to be big enough so that everywhere in the network you're achieving at least 240 kilopascals as a minimum flow, uh, as a minimum pressure. And then on the other side of the uh, extreme, when there's no demand at night 
on maybe a winter day when all the factories are closed uh, and there's just essentially the static conditions, you can't have more than 850 kilopascals anywhere in the network. So at all times your pressure has to be between 240 and no greater than 850. And so what causes pressure in the network is how high on the hill the reservoir is located. If you have the reservoir down here at 225, then that's not going to provide very much pressure because of the elevation difference between where the reservoir is located and the elevation of the land at each junction. But if you have the reservoir too high on the hill, the problem is, is that uh, during those nighttime hours where there's no demand, the static pressure would be too high. Okay, so I bet you're, you have a lot of thoughts right now. You're getting tons of information all at once. Any questions you want to ask so far? Um, Jeffrey, go ahead. So uh, we have three zones going to have different population centers. Um, so that means different urbanization areas? Yeah, let me give you the... Uh, the assumptions that you're going to apply. Let me hand that out now. Maybe we can turn to that page because I think it will address the question that you're asking. Alright, so if you turn to the uh, second to the last page, you should find your name on that table. And uh, so here's the information that we have is you know first of all the location, the city that you're assigned and the reason I've given you that is that you may be able to look up some specific information about the weather data, the rainfall information because that's going to affect how much water you deliver to the golf course. Um, now, the next column, it says North Zone Residential NFF. That means that's the needed fire flow. So that's a certain amount of water you have to provide to the North Zone that's on top of all the other demands. You know, on top of the, uh, the demands from the people that are living there, you have to provide a certain capacity in the pipe in case there's a fire. Okay. I also give you in the next column the, uh, the population density. And so you can measure with a ruler what's the area of the north zone. You know, how many square centimeters is it? And then once you know how many square centimeters it is, you can convert that into square meters. Because as it says down at the bottom left of the, uh, the diagram, the scale is 1 to 10,000. So 1 centimeter in length is 100 meters in actual distance. So if you multiply the area of the north zone by the population density, then that'll tell you how many people live inside the north zone. So maybe you've got 3,000 people living in the north zone, just as a for instance. So then, now that you know the population uh, density, there's also the commercial population density. And so that is the um, the number of people that will be in the north zone doing commercial activities. So there's the residential population density, the commercial population density, and then you'll notice that there's also data for the uh, south zone. The south zone though, I think it only has um, residential. There's no commercial areas in the, uh, in the south zone. Uh, there's information about how many guests are in the hotel that is in the east zone, the food processing plant, the amount of million gallons, MG by the way stands for million gallons, how many millions gallons of water per week they consume at the food processing plant. So just a lot of data that you're going to have to convert somehow into flow rates by looking at you know, what is the, the population demand for water. One of the resources that I've put online for you is a uh, PDF file. Let's see. All right. Design project example data. 
So I hope that you do additional outside research. Um, it's not an A project if you only rely on this, this packet of data that I'm showing you. I mean, it could still be a B project if you don't do the outside research, but it wouldn't be an A project. So you know, this is for Davis, California and for England, the uh, precipitation by month, evaporation by month, and so you could probably find local data for your city of this same sort. Um, here is some irrigation water use. Here is a table that shows water demand on a per person basis. And so look at the units of this. This is the average municipal water use for domestic. And so that means in a household. The average in the United States is 220 liters per person per day. But that's the average in the United States. You know, how do people actually use water in Chicago? Uh, you could probably do a Google search and find something that the city of Chicago has put out where they're estimating how much water people actually use in Chicago. And hopefully you'll be able to find something that's in these same units of how many liters per person per day. So the water use in a dry climate like Albuquerque could be radically different from the water use in a wet climate like Minneapolis. But this will give you a sense for what would be a reasonable starting guess, 220 liters per person per day. So there are similar data that you could find that breaks it down like where of that 220 liters, how is it being used? How much is going towards the toilet? How much is going towards washing the car on a daily basis? So specific breakdown, there's data about different places besides residential areas. How much water is used at an airport, a motel, a theater, a shopping center. So lots of different data has been gathered to estimate the range of uses and then a typical value and what the unit of uh, measurement is. hospitals, prisons, rest homes. So. so that's just an example of how you can um, develop demand from other data like the size of a factory or the uh, number of guests in a hotel or the number of beds in a hospital. It's data like this and you're welcome to use this data but I hope that you'll also do some additional research. Does that answer your question, Jeffrey? I think so. Okay. Are there any other questions at this point? Um, I need to, well, I guess this will depend on each situation. I know, for example, you talked about the golf course, uh -huh. the driest week. Um, well, I know there's differences like per year or there's even like, Hundred year dry, like what if we yeah. Say, I've experienced the absolute worst. Yeah. Months, so we go on. We That's a good question. So my suggestion is just go with the average year. Okay. So what's the driest week on an average year? Not what's the driest week of the driest year, because that would always be no rainfall. But um, yeah, what's the and most likely what you're going to find is monthly rainfall data. And so if you can't find rainfall data on a weekly basis, that's fine. It's okay to take the monthly rainfall data and then divide that by four. You know, so if, you know, if in your town the driest month of the year is July and they have one inch in the month of July, then you can just say a quarter inch each week during that monthly period. <coughs> Jeffrey? So on the project location part, so are we using it real cities or fictional cities you're going to, the information you're going to give us? Um, what you should assume is that there's this suburb that's being built in the real city that I've mentioned to you. So let's assume that there's some raw land that's currently undeveloped and in your case uh, what you have the San Diego, right? So 
we're assuming that you'll use the same weather data and you'll try and find information about how much water people use in San Diego. And so that's why I've told you the city is so that you can get location specific weather data and location specific um, population uh, kind of trends. Okay. But probably the city of San Diego doesn't have some big plot of land that isn't developed. We're just assuming that it does. Okay. Now, um, you know, the stuff that I was showing you where it said 220 liters per person per day, that's the average. But over the course of a day, water demand patterns vary a lot. What this figure illustrates is on the maximum day of the year when the water is being used. And this is kind of just another national average. It would probably vary from place to place. But on a typical basis, the maximum day of the year, you'll notice that the peak demand is going to be in the evening. In the evening when people are at home and doing the activities that consumes water. Uh, and this is as a percentage of the average day. And so if the average day is 220 liters per person per day, you could find out how many liters per second that is. You know, if it's liters per day, then you divide by how many seconds are there in a day? 86,400? So divide by 86,400 and you could find how many liters per second is being demanded. And you know, if, if you're just talking about one person, it's going to be a really, really small amount, liter per second. But when you multiply that by the population in any given zone, then you'll have some average demand, but then we can peak that. And there's something called peaking factors. <coughs> uh, the maximum daily demand is 1.8 times the average day. And the maximum hourly demand is 3.25 times the average daily demand. And so we want to design our network so that it can handle all contingencies. It can handle either this maximum hourly demand or the maximum daily demand plus a fire occurring at the same time. There is a uh, summary handout, the, the page after the one that we've just been talking about, that says Demand Forecasting Summary Table. And it helps you to understand what are the, uh, um, the flow rates that you should assume is going to be coming out of those green arrows. So it says here that the design condition is the larger of the maximum hourly flow or the larger of the maximum daily flow. And I've constructed this demand forecasting table in a really specific way. Like certain cells are merged together, certain cells are separate, and it means something, the reason why it's that way. And so just for example, what you can do is uh, you can fill in these blanks with your assumptions and the research and the calculations you do. And this is going to help you to identify what is the design flow rate per outlet. So the design flow rate is how much water is used by the entire north zone. But then the design flow rate per outlet, if we go back to the map, you'll notice that in the north zone, there are two arrows that feed water into the north zone. There's junction A and junction M. And so all of the water that's demanded inside of the north zone, you divide that quantity by two, and half of it goes from this arrow, and half of it goes from that. And the assumption is that there's lots of smaller kind of lateral pipe segments that we're not yet having to size. That this is an initial design for the backbone of the water network. And so you want to have uh, like the biggest pipes that the smaller lateral pipes are going to be drawing from. Sometimes in engineering there's the idea of the 30% design or a preliminary design that's a placeholder for what would be done later on once the project is further along. And so what we're doing is not every pipe that will be going into the network, but just kind of making sure that we have the right of way and that the main trunk lines are in the ground so that the, the city can be developed. Now the other thing that we have to keep in mind is not only do we want to have this network so that it's uh, big enough for the worst day of the year, 
but over time the demand is going to increase. If this starts out as raw land, probably in year one there's not going to be full population density at, at the very beginning. And so we want the pipe network to be big enough that it can handle the design when it's completely built out, when there's a maximum number of people living there. And that's a mistake that cities often make is that they build their infrastructure for today's population instead of the future population. And Huntington is an example of, of the problem there. Like they sized their sewer networks for the people that lived in Huntington at the time. And they weren't necessarily thinking about all the other adjacent neighbor neighborhoods that were going to be built and all the increased uh, demand for space in the sewer. So that's part of why we have so much flooding in Huntington is that the conveyance network, the drainage that's uh, taking the wastewater and the stormwater away, those weren't sized with uh, 2020 in mind. They were sized with maybe 1950 in mind. So the, uh, the data that I've given you, like the population density, that's when it's at completely built out. And so you're designing for the worst case scenario. At the end of its useful life, when it's fully like, saturated with people, um, hottest day of the year, and then we want to compare what's going to happen, uh, the larger of the maximum daily flow plus the fire, or the maximum hourly flow. So we may talk more about how to fill in this demand forecasting table, but I just wanted to point out that it is in this uh, packet that it, I've already given you. Um, did you want us to submit this table to you? I do, yeah. And in fact, um, there's some pretty extensive instructions in the handout I've given you. I won't read through them all right now. But if you look at the handout, I explain for each phase of the project what I expect to see and when. So just briefly, let's first talk about the, uh, the grading. Um, the project, half of the project points are uh, assigned at the draft submission stages, and half of the points are at the final, um, the last report that you turn in. And what I found is that it's a lot easier to do this project if we break it up into pieces instead of you having to just work on it and not get feedback along the way and then turn it in all at once at the end of the semester. And so there are draft stages. And so for example, for the demand forecasting, you're going to turn in your calculations related to that on Monday, March 9th. And so uh, when you submit it, I'll go through and I have my own calculations for what I think is a reasonable quantity of water in each one of your, um, each one of your cities because I've, I've done the calculations based on the assumptions that I gave you. And, and your assumptions may be different than mine. I know like what's a reasonable envelope of flow rates. And then if, if yours is very different from mine, I'll look more into what the assumptions are and how well you've documented the the details of your background research and so on. But um, yeah, so that first stage for demand forecasting is March 9th. Then the next phase of the project is the pipe sizing. And so you turn in your draft by March 20th for that. That's our class meeting before you go for spring break. And then the sizing of the reservoir. So you have to size how big the reservoir needs to be. That is a relatively easy process. That's due on the 6th of uh, April. The cost analysis, you don't submit a draft calculation of that. That only uh, gets submitted with the final report. And the final report is due on the 20th of April. And what you need to do in the final report is I'll give you feedback along the way about changes you should make in, in what you've turned in from the draft. And so in the final report, you should give me what's the final design and also uh, address how your design has evolved. So you'd kind of maybe show the, the beginning map that you turned in with your draft and then the final map and you talk about what extra work did you do since the last time I saw your design. Uh, so that's an overview. Can you remind me what was your specific question because I lost track of what I was trying it's to... just about the table. Oh yeah, the table. Yeah, so that's how um, 
the, the calculations that you do for demand estimation, it can be hand calculations. And then you would just fill in this table by hand. And that could be totally fine. I mean, you could get an A, 100% full credit with hand calculations and filling this table in by hand. Or if you want to, uh, to have a spreadsheet for some of your calculations, that's fine too. But then you need to summarize them in this format because I'm going to be looking at everyone has a different city and a different style. I needed like kind of one standardized way for you to summarize what you found out for your demand estimation. And so that's why this summary table, everyone's going to use the same summary table. Okay, are there other questions? Just things that are popping into your mind so far? Jeffrey? Uh, so on the uh, part two, the pipe network sizing, mm -hmm. So are we just making a rough map pipe design area? We don't, not like a, two different houses, like the smaller pipe, just the main network? That's right, yeah. You only have to deliver water to, uh, to where those arrows are. Okay. You don't have to deliver water, um, you know, you're not going to have to pick where people live or where office buildings are. It's just... Uh, at the junctions that I've identified should be a junction that you create in water gems. So that's another thing is um, you need to download and install water, Bentley water gems if you don't have it already. And um, hopefully today we'll have some time to go through setting up a network on there. Uh, one of the resources that is on in this folder, there's a whole folder of information related to the project. So here in the project folder, one of the things is a map. Now there's a PDF of the map, and then there's also a JPEG. And if you just click on the JPEG, it'll open it in the browser. But what you need to do is right click, save link as, and then you can, oh no, that's not it. I think maybe you have to do the save link as before you open it. Let's see. Save link as. Yeah, all right, so project map scaled. Um, and the reason why it's good to have a scaled map is that you can bring this image in in the background, and then it's, you can draw your network on top of it. So I've just saved that. And now here in Water Gems, oh, let's see, it's been a while since I did that. Let's see if I can Oh no, import the image. So what you want to do is down here new file, browse to the location of the map, <coughs> and it will give you this, and it's asking how many pixels is there in a meter. And I've scaled this map so that you don't have to change anything. So in the map, the JPEG file I've given you, one pixel is one meter. So you just kind of leave it as the default, where it's asking to know what are the corner sizes, like what's the resolution of the image. So they want to know the relationship between how many pixels and what length that represents. And so just leave it as the default. Hmm. I'll have to debug this error message. If I remember correctly, this, it's happened before bringing up the image file. I'll uh, figure that out and get back to you. Um, but the idea is that you'll bring the image in the background and then you'll just be able to draw your network on top of it and so that you won't have to do the scaled lengths. Um, you know, like where you click the cursor will actually uh, build the, build the uh, property of the length of the pipe. Okay, so schedule-wise, this is spread out over the rest of the semester and I've tried to pick the submission date so that it, it's not on the same day as another homework assignment. And so if we bring up the syllabus and schedule for the course, you'll see that all of the dates of these submissions are here on the schedule. So for example, phase one, the demand estimation, that's in between homework assignments. Phase two is after an assignment. So it's never on the same day as a homework assignment. And you're turning it in on Monday of the last week of classes. So I think it's a popular thing to have some projects do on the very last day of class. But I try and bring this forward a little bit so that 
uh, you know, kind of uh, it's less crowded later in the week for you. You can turn your attention to other things. Okay, so any other questions about the design project before we move on from that? Um, not often, but just once in a while, I'll get an email or a question that it's clear they didn't read the handout. And I'd hate for you to have that humiliating situation of asking me a question where it's just like what you're asking is maybe even the very first statement in a paragraph. So my suggestion is definitely ask me questions, but also read the, uh, read the handout. Um, this is probably like the 15th time I've given this project or some variation of it. And over the years, I fine-tuned the project. Uh, this project is, is going to be a lot easier for you than it was for the, uh, the first groups of students that I assigned it to, because back then they were solving it without, uh, without water gems, if you can believe that. It was a rough, a rough project for them. So you've got some uh, better tools than they had. But um, you know, a lot of the hiccups that have come up over the years, I've tried to um, explain in the handout. So look over the materials that I put into the folder, this uh, project folder. And that in the project folder is also where you submit each of the phases. And so phase one, that's where you're turning in your scans and calculations and report about demand estimation. In phase two, you're going to upload two maps. That's all you turn in is a couple of annotated maps. One map of how your network performs under the design condition of high flow rates. And then the other map you're going to upload is a PDF file that shows your network and how it's behaving under static conditions where there's no flow demands. And so the high pressures and the low pressures at the end of the spectrum for your network. Phase three, you're uploading a spreadsheet that shows your calculations for the required volume of the um, tank. And then the final report is kind of everything integrated together. OK, so any other questions? All right, so um, like I mentioned, you're going to be using water gems for this project. And um, just as a refresher on how water gems works, I thought that what we would do would be to rework this example that we did in class using the spreadsheet. Um, rework it just as a demonstration with water gems and see how closely the flow rates and the pressures match. And so this is one that you may remember I solved with the spreadsheet and we found the pressure at each junction and we found the flow rate through each pipe and the flow direction. And so let's try and set this same network up <coughs> in water gems and see if we get the same flow rates and so on. So I've added two things into this illustration that didn't exist and that is a couple of reservoirs because in water gems uh, you can't just tell it that the water is coming in. You have to give it a place that the water is coming from. And the simplest way to do that is with a reservoir. And so we'll create some reservoir at A that's causing this one cubic meter per second to be able to come in. And we'll put in some reservoir at D, because that was the other location that water was coming in. And in water gems, actually, what you specify is the outflow. So you don't tell it where water's coming into the network. You tell it where you're taking water out of the network. And so we knew from that previous example the pressure at A was 600 kilopascals, and so then that gave a, a pressure head at A, and we likewise have a pressure head at D. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and set this same network up um, in water gems just so that you can kind of remind yourself how the uh, program functions. Okay, so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, draw a reservoir. So here on the Home tab, the Layout, if you right click once you have it down into the screen, that allows you to change from a junction to a reservoir. And so I'm going to have a reservoir that's, oh, that symbols are really small, I'll have to zoom in. Uh, the, a 
reservoir that's connected to a junction. <laughs> Touching the wrong keyboard because I brought my laptop. <sighs> okay. Uh, reservoir to a junction. Okay. Um, let's zoom in. Right now, the symbols are so small, I can't actually see anything that it drew. Hmm, I may have to pull the plug on this example. I just installed the program this afternoon. I haven't checked yet to see if it's working, and it's not. All right, well, I guess what we'll do is leave this here for now. And what I'm going to show you next time we get together after the exam, exam we'll have the exam on Wednesday. But then on Friday, I'll uh, solve this example. And I'll also show you how you can import the scaled map in the background. I'll figure out whatever that error message is. Um, and so you can just draw right on top of a scaled map. But Remember that uh, for the exam on Wednesday, your task between now and then is to uh, prepare the equation sheet that you want to use. And my suggestion is refamiliarize yourself with the Excel examples, because you'll have at least one problem where you need to use Excel. And then there will also be some hand calculations. But there aren't going to be any short answer or concept question. So you don't have to be prepared to write any of those. Pardon me? There's only be one Excel problem. I don't know. There will be at least one. Yeah. At least one. All right. Have a good day. I'll see you for the exam on Wednesday.